So, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this one and only <coughs> discussion on music at uh, this year's Battle of Ideas Festival. Uh, this session is called, as I'm sure you're all aware, A Cultured Ear, Why Does Listening to Music Matter? My name is Sarah Boys. I'm assistant editor of Culture Wars, which is the online review of the Institute of Ideas at culturewars.org.uk, and I'll be chairing this session this afternoon. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the debate format by now. Each of the speakers have about five to seven minutes to present their case. We'll have a brief discussion up here on the panel and then straight out for comments and questions and so on from the floor. Um, I have been asked to remind you, if you could please make sure your mobile phones are switched off um, as they do interfere with the PA system. Um, OK, thank you. So. When we began putting this session together for this year's Battle of Ideas, it did seem a bit strange to have a discussion about music right in the middle of a political festival in the middle of a recession. Nevertheless, um, although I'm probably preaching to the converted, I think there are lots of social, cultural and political issues that we can get out of discussing music, especially in the current climate. It often seems today that whilst music and sound increasingly permeates modern society, that people often lament that we no longer know how to listen. Um, there is a slightly nostalgic element to this idea, I think, the idea that modern society is so schizophrenic and buzzing um, that we've, we've lost the art of being able to connect to something very important that music has historically given us and seems incapable of perhaps providing in the present day. Nevertheless, I think it's important to point out that the landscape in the 21st century is very different from the landscape, say, in the 17th or 18th century, when a lot of the pieces of music that used to be championed as being very important in the past were written, indeed the functions for which they were written. <coughs> um, this has led, as I'm sure many of you have, have discussed before, to a debate around the point um, of classical music. There's been a lot of talk about the so-called death of classical music, um, and in response we've then had um, people trying to defend classical music um, on, elite, on elitist grounds, but whether or not that sort of a defence has worked or not remains to be seen. Um, I think it's fair also to say there's been a lot of cheerleading around something like classical music, even a, a sort of classical music protectionism, um, very much at, at the expense of being able to see the worth of other forms of music and other genres. Um, Yet, I think there's, there's still an open question, to come back to the title of this discussion, about what it actually means to be cultured musically, the idea of there being a distinct set of music works or artworks that we can point to and aspire to and say are the important universal things about contemporary culture seems very much old hat. So to try and uh, throw a bit of light on all of these issues and much more, um, I'll introduce the illustrious panel in the order that they will be speaking. So firstly, to my far left, your right, we have music critic Ivan Hewitt. Ivan has spoke with us many times at the Battle of Ideas. Um, his most famous book, I think, is called Healing the Rift, and he's also a, a music composer. Secondly, we'll have Rachel Halliburton to my far right, uh, to your far left. Rachel is best known as deputy editor of Time Out. She is a journalist and she's written previously on music education and the current government's music manifesto. Speaking thirdly, we have an author, Philip Hencher, second to my left. Um, Philip is the professor of creative writing at Exeter University. Uh, his most recent book, Northern Clemency, was long listed for the Man Booker Prize last year. Shortlisted, sorry Philip, has been shortlisted for the Man Booker last year, so well done for that Philip. Um, and he's asked me not to tell you, but I will mention, he's also written a libretto for a Thomas Addis opera called Powder Her Face. Um, speaking fourthly, we then have Carl Eric Norman, who is to my left. Carl Eric is the founder and secretary general of the European Cultural Parliament, and he is also a former opera singer. And then lastly, but by no means least, to my right, we have Tom Hutchinson. Tom is a clarinetist, and he coordinates Here, Here, which is a classical music project in the first of its kind dedicated solely to discussing the subject of listening, and that is presented by the Royal Philharmonic Society, Classic FM, and the Paul Hamlin Foundation. And we're delighted that Tom and Here Here are sponsoring this session at this year's Battle of Ideas. So can we have a, a warm welcome for our panel, please?
OK, thank you. When you're ready, Ivan. Thank you, Sarah. Well, the, the title of this um, session, which is to do with a cultured ear, got me thinking about whether there might be such a thing as an innocent ear, which I guess would be the closest thing you could think of as the opposite to a cultured ear, an innocent ear. And there was, years ago, uh, the, the third programme, I think I'm right in saying this, um, had a, quite a long-running series called The Innocent Ear, which consisted of pieces of art, music, classical music, art music, presented to the listener without any preparatory announcements, so that you heard these pieces not knowing what they were. Uh, some of you might be old enough to remember this. I, I'm not, I have to say. Uh, it, it was popular. It was popular, and it was, it was a kind of polemical gesture on the part of the producer, a rather good composer called Robert Simpson, uh, who felt that one could be burdened with knowledge, you know, and that one should approach music in this, in this innocent way. Uh, now, I've got very mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, I think it's a total myth. I, I don't think any of us have innocent ears. I think we are all inevitably uh, acculturated when it comes to music. You know, by the time one reaches one's teens, one knows instinctively what one likes, and one is able to listen to that kind of music in a very competent way. It's one of those things that's, that's kind of unavoidable, really, like learning language. So it, maybe that suggests that we have three different states of ear. There's the innocent ear, which may well be, you know, a kind of like, rather like a, the scientist's pure gas. You know, you, you, you can't attain it. There's the acculturated ear, which we all have willy-nilly just by virtue of being human. And then there's this other funny thing called a cultured ear. Now, or maybe a cultivated ear. And I wonder what that might be. And... I guess one might, uh, as a kind of preliminary f shot at this notion, say that it's to do with temporarily, in the aim of some higher aim, setting aside one's acculturation, setting aside one's tastes, in the interest of acquiring some other set of skills, which, for whatever reason, one thinks may be better. Getting a cultivated ear is often thought about in terms of getting a, a certain kind of knowledge. You get, to f you get to discover what a perfect cadence is. You get to discover what a m major triad is, or a seventh chord, and what those things imply in terms of a musical discourse. But I wonder whether perhaps the, the essential thing about setting out to get a cultivated ear is not so, is not so much an aesthetic thing at all, it's, and it's certainly not to do with acquiring a kind of knowledge, either active or passive, it's more a kind of ethical decision. It's a kind of, it's a saying to oneself, uh, maybe a, a certain kind of inherited culture is wiser than I am, and maybe I'm going to voluntarily submit to it. It's a, it's a, it's a voluntary act of submission. I'm going to take this on, uh, in, in despite of my own acculturation perhaps, because I have good reason to think there may be something in it that's bigger than me and bigger than my tastes. Um, there was a long, very rambling article by Paul Morley in The Observer some months ago, I don't know whether you read it, sort of on this topic. And although I found it quite hard to figure out what he was on about, I th glimmering in amongst all these words, I think, was a notion that, that, that he had this sense that out there in this colossal body of inherited music was something that... <laughs> was sufficiently valuable for him to set aside his own tastes for a while and acquire that. So that, I, I'd just like to float the suggestion that this getting a cultivated ear is as much a, a kind of ethical move and a social move as it is a purely aesthetic or musical move. Yeah, that's, that, that's, my, that's my preliminary shot. Get you a clap too. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, so on to Rachel. Thank you. Like Ivan, I started off thinking about the innocent ear uh, and ended up strangely finding myself uh, writing a diatribe against modern classical music, which surprised me a little, but <laughs> let me take you on my journey. Um, I spent an awful lot of this year singing, not because I've got pretensions to anything professional, and for this the world should thank me, but because I had a baby in January. Despite the fact that, like every other obnoxious middle-class parent, I played him bar, he's no prodigy. So at nine months, we're still in the pre-speech stage of his existence. 
And music feels like a very natural form of communication. Using it, I can make him laugh, teach him basic patterns, and on the odd blissful occasion, settle him down to sleep. But the singing is not necessary. Feeding him, changing his nappy, these are all needed for the basic animal process of keeping him alive. But music is not. Yet it feels like a very fundamental way of reaching out to him. Instinctively, it feels like the first way in which I am teaching him to be human. But how and why is, on the surface, unquantifiable. In his book, Musicophilia, Oliver Sacks tells the, to uh, the story of Tony Sicoria, an orthopedic surgeon who is struck by lightning while he is talking on a payphone. Previously only interested in rock music, a few weeks after his near-death experience, he starts to crave classical music, especially piano music by Chopin. His round-the-clock obsession with listening to this music and composing his own doesn't affect his job, but his marriage disintegrates. Sachs, as ever, proposes an interesting neurological theory. He has encountered other patients who had developed a greater sympathy for classical music, in one case following the administration of drugs for brain seizures, and in another case following the diagnosis of a brain tumour. What links these cases, he believes, is a heightened connection between the perceptual part of the brain known as the temporal lobes and the emotional part known as the limbic system. So can it be boiled down to this? That those of us who like classical music today have a hotline between our emotional and perceptual equipment that those who like Dizzy Rascal don't? Could it perhaps even be argued that an evolutionary change has occurred, slowing the connection between the temporal lobes and the limbic system? And that's why Chopin is out and Chipmunk is in. Such biological reductivism is, of course, absurd. Sachs' analysis contributes a piece of the jigsaw, but far from all of it. A more significant part is looking at the way we listen to classical music today. At the start of Alex Ross's fantastic The Rest is Noise, he talks about the premiere of Richard Strauss's Salome, which caused a scandal because of its perceived combination of immorality and cacophony. Normally, it would have been performed in Vienna, but it was deemed too controversial for the Austrian capital, so it was translated to the more neutral location of Graz. In anticipation of the scandal, several members of Europe's royal families were in attendance. It was, in other words, a news story, an international event, which actually ended happily for Strauss when it received a 10-minute standing ovation. There are many similar moments in classical music's history when key political figures were in attendance for the opening performance of a new work by a composer. It's impossible to listen to a Shostakovich symphony, for instance, without imagining Stalin sitting there. This is a sinister example, but it still raises the question, why doesn't classical music speak for society like this anymore? Perhaps there are still some modern composers, like Philip's collaborator Thomas Addis, whose new compositions feel like events. But for better or for much, much worse, it is not perceived to be of the same level as national interest as a Robbie Williams comeback. <coughs> Personally, I think two things are responsible for classical music sidelining on the national stage. And the first is electricity, which more than anything else has revolutionized the way that we listen to music. When the Russian cosmonaut Gagarin became the first person to orbit the Earth in 1961, he famously whistled Shostakovich's song, The Motherland Hears, the motherland knows. Radio had already made Shostakovich a composer of international importance, and now television was strangely showing him to be a composer of interplanetary importance. But there's no small irony in the fact that the song was composed in 1951, the same year in which a white Cleveland disc jockey, Alan Freed, started broadcasting, broadcasting black music to teenagers in a program which he decided to call Moondog Rock and Roll Party, thereby naming a phenomenon. Radio and television ripped formality from the listening experience. It allowed music to be listened to in the bar and the bedroom as much as in the concert hall. And eventually, rock music has proved the beneficiary. Most recent listening figures have shown that in the last quarter, Radio 1 attracted more than 11 million listeners per week, while Radio 3 attracted just under 2 million. Even Classic FM, described by some as a rock and roll channel for classical music, only reaches 5.5 million listeners per week. Add to this statistical comparisons of how much rock music is downloaded onto iPods compared to how much classical, and classical music looks increasingly like as niche a pursuit as collecting tea bag covers. The overt sexualization of society has also changed our demands for what music does. 
Electricity allows the kind of amplification that sends bolts through the body that even an orchestra playing Mahler's Resurrection Symphony cannot master. I've tried to convert some people to classical music by taking them to the proms. And yes, the Royal Albert Hall does have dodgy acoustics. But one of the problems has clearly been that they don't get the kind of class A hit from the vibrations of a Mozart piano concerto that they do from the killers. It's a cliche to say we're bombarded with sensual stimulation these days, but one result is that, though the emotional and perceptual systems in the brain have not evolved to become more disconnected, as I joked, our ears have been taught that they do not need to work so hard at decoding the emotions in a piece of music. Why listen carefully when subsonic technology means that not just your ears, but your whole body will end up vibrating to a song? Why search for the sensuality in Messiaen when you can have your bones well and truly rattled by Led Zeppelin? I'm going to shut up in a second, but before I do, I'm going to come full circle and go back to why I sing to my son. And this is the second way in which I'm explaining why classical music has been sidelined. I believe that the things that bring us comfort early in life go on to become very potent devices later on, such as the story, as countless novelists and indeed politicians have demonstrated, and the game of let's pretend, as both the theatre and film industries can attest. Oliver Sacks declares that we may go to a play to learn about jealousy, betrayal, vengeance, love, but music, instrumental music, can tell us nothing of these. Well, he's wrong. From those songs sung to us when we're babies, we learn that music plays a fundamental part in the narrative of our lives, and we use it again and again in those central narratives, when we're falling in love, when we're unhappy in love, when we're celebrating, when we're grieving, when we're trying to rev ourselves up, and when we're trying to calm down. Yet if we're falling in love to classical music, and I am happy to be challenged on this, most of us now reach back to another century, maybe to Liszt, possibly to a bit of Sex and Chopin. Uh -huh. um, I believe that most modern composers, by waving goodbye to tonality, may be producing more intellectually stimulating output, but they have unplugged themselves from the songs and harmonies that make us respond most basically, and therefore most powerfully. It's true I feel a shiver go down my spine when I listen to Ligeti, but I'll never fall in love to him. I'll applaud Judith Weir's harmonic experimentalism, but I'll never have her music played at a loved one's funeral. This might sound banal, but it's felt on a national level too. When the Berlin Wall came down 20 years ago, what was played at the most significant concert held in celebration? No work by Schockhausen, though he was arguably then the country's most significant contemporary composer, but Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. This debate asks, why does listening to music matter? And I'm aware that I've changed it to, why doesn't listening to modern classical music matter anymore? But I believe, I believe that like every art form, music should continue to provoke and explore different ways of getting under our skin. But though I would hate to have a world without dissonance, I believe that rock music stole classical music's thunder when it took over the role of providing society's songs and dances, not least by absorbing that power of electricity to provide the level of energy that an increasingly sex and technology obsessed society needed. For me, asking why does listening to music matter is another way of asking why does music make us human. Personally, no one would cheer louder than I would if modern classical music started to provide that answer again. But until it does, and continuing to make my arguments for the richness of classical music with Schubert and Beethoven, and top up my 21st century requirements with a little bit of Radiohead on the side. <laughs> Okay, appealing to all the radio head fans in the audience there. Um, and uh, moving on to uh, Carl, oh, oh, sorry, no, moving on to Philip Pencher, sorry. Yeah, um, I think we can, um, we can uh, claim that uh, um, the art music is in a much better state, I think, than, um, um, than is customarily assumed. And if uh, five and a half million people a week really are listening to Classic FM, that doesn't seem to me at all um, a niche pursuit. That's... Um, that's 10% of the adult population. That's an enormous number of people. Um, I don't know whether, it, I, can't, I don't understand radio uh, figures, but that does seem large, like a large number of people. Um, a lot of, you know, the proms are filled every night. The, you know, it's never, it's never really been more popular. We're living in a golden age, in many ways, of, um, um, of, of art music. I remember um, when, I was, when I was growing up, um, if I wanted to buy a record, a recording, uh, even so famous a piece as Piero Lunaire. I remember having to get on a train and going to Manchester, um, which was my nearest decent record shop, um, and buying it there. Now you, could pro you, can, you can look it up on YouTube. You can look anything up on YouTube. Um, we'd, we, 
it ought to be, it ought to feel like a golden age of art music, and yet um, it doesn't. And I think why, the reason it doesn't is something to do with um, what Harold Macmillan called the narrative argument. And I think that uh, art music has, in some way, lost the, the narrative argument here. Um, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was uh, waiting for um, some friends at, um, at Stockwell Tube Station, and um, they were about 15 minutes late. And just as I went into the ticket hall, um, I heard the, over the loudspeaker um, the first movement of the Eroica Symphony starting up. And I had a very pleasant quarter of an hour listening to the first movement of the Eroica Symphony. I was really deeply enjoying it. I thought, in my naive way, how kind of London Underground to lay on from the great masterpieces. And then I realised, of course, they lay it on because they assume that everybody hates the noise that it makes, and no one will hang around to um, sell... <laughs> no one will hang around to sell um, their, their marijuana tablets to each other. Um, no one will hang around to mug other people because they'll listen to... Uh, they'll get as far as bar five of the Eroica Symphony, and they'll go, oh, no, I'm not having that. That is, um, that is a culture that's, um, that's lost the argument on behalf of Beethoven. Um, there are national newspapers that have um, a supplement that comes out every four weeks called Music, the Music Monthly. Do they, what do they mean by music? They mean pop music. They, they never, a music supplement will, on the whole, not necessarily cover art music. That is a culture that's lost the narrative argument. And I think partly it's to do with the way that um, music, which for centuries has been one of the most important parts of our, inner, our common inner life, is, shut, is shunted off by the mass media into small little ghettos. BBC Two finds, without any effort whatsoever, 14 hours a week to, to treat us to crown green bowling, to darts, whatever. Um, it is absolutely impossible to imagine BBC Two saying, why don't we have half an hour of Mitsuko Ushida playing Schubert impromptus? They just never would. They never would. Lost the argument. Now, I think back, I think this has happened quite recently. Um, I think back to um, the sort of upbringing that I had and the sort of um, person with a relationship to art music that I have. I'm not a professional musician. Um, I don't have any professional relations, really, to the world of classical music. But I did music A-level. I, um, uh, I had engagement with, um, with musicological analysis. Um, I learned how to harmonise a Bach chorale, and it's been a lasting source of pleasure to me. The sort of uh, musical culture that Arnold Bennett describes in, in his uh, accounts of... Uh, uh, early 20th century life of um, in the death of Simon Fugue, there's a very memorable moment when um, two school teachers in Stoke-on-Trent um, get out a copy of a piano duet and say, let's have a look at this, it's just arrived. And it's the forehand score of the Symphonia Domestica, the Strauss Symphonia Domestica, which must have been premiered about two years earlier. That culture is almost incredible now. You couldn't imagine that happening. I think that what we have in place of an enga the engagement with the long history of art music, the ability to follow a musical argument, I think that has disappeared or it is disappearing. And I find it, you know, much as I, much as I love a lot of, um, of popular music, of, uh, of mass culture, I can't see it as operating on the same sustained intellectual level. I do think that it's lost, it has no interest, it has lost touch with the history of its own art. And in place of an art which had developed to the point where it could sustain a single argument over an hour, an hour and a half, even two hours in some of, the case of some of Wagner's acts, we have an art which finds it pretty difficult to keep going for more than three minutes. Um, I think that there are things to be said for the 
three minute pop song. I think there is a, something to be said for an art that has no real interest or capacity to sustain over more than that. I honestly can't see it as much as an improvement, and I'm really a little bit pessimistic. Uh, Ivan's just indicating to uh, yes. have a quick... Well, I, I <laughs> found myself kind of with you all the way, Philip, until, I, until the very end when I thought, hang on, you started off by saying we're in a golden age. No, no, <coughs> I'm saying we ought to be in a golden age. We ought to be in a golden age. What I said was I repeated what Harold Macmillan said about neglecting the narrative argument. The narrative argument has gone completely against um, the development of, of, um, of art music, and it's dying. It's dying. So, so would you say those five and a half million are, are, are somehow not really hearing it, what they're not listening? They're, the unheard, they're, they're an audience that nobody knows about. OK, I think we have a debate. Um, so for more of the debate, uh, we'll now go okay. to Carl Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Listen now. Yes. This was part, uh, a very short part, of uh, the work of John Cage's <laughs> work <coughs> uh, for. 33, which is supposed to be a silence of 4 minutes and 33 seconds. You can imagine to, uh, to multiply this, this has a, had a strong effect when it was performed in 1952. I'm sure several of you have heard about it. I'll give you another uh, example without uh, illustrating it. Uh, an old friend and older friend of mine, uh, a Swedish composer, I'm from Sweden, uh, Carl Erik Wellin um, was. Oi, I, I'm all, almost yeah. illustrating what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> it was uh, a little bit uh, more brutal what he did because he came, he entered the stage, and um, uh, he produced a power saw. And with his motor power saw, he started sawing on the legs of the grand piano, a Bechstein. This was in 1964, and he, he was rather rude with that, uh, with that poor piano. But, but then at a certain moment, you know, it's very hard, uh, con uh, hard tree uh, in this one. So the saw went wrong, and he cut his own leg and had to go to the hospital. But, but his point was made. <laughs> now... The point is, of course, both of, of uh, Cage and of Velin is the point uh, where, where are the limits of music and uh, how, how do we go about uh, music? What, what can we do with the music? Uh, what, uh, uh, well, he, they ask us to reflect what it is like doing music and listening to music. Then, of course, all of these modernists from the 50s and 60s, they always went back to the big maestre of the, of the uh, 18th and 19th century. And of course, particularly, I know that Carl Erik Wellin always went back to, uh, to, to the greatest of the last millennium, to, to um, Johann Sebastian Bach. He was a great organist and, uh, um, and pianist also, my friend. My, I myself, uh, I used to uh, dabble around uh, with, as an opera tenor some 20 years ago, breaking my diplomatic career. I guess I was something like, uh, well, uh, second division level uh, in, the, in the opera club. But I, had the, the, uh, I was fortunate enough to, to meet somebody from the Champions League. Uh, and... Um, this was a lady called uh, Doris Soffel, who is, <coughs> who is now probably the best Wagner and Strauss uh, mezzo uh, in the world today. She's, next week she is really giving some, uh, some um, narrative argument together with Peter Konvichny uh, in the, uh, the new Amsterdam production of Salome, by the way. Um, the, uh, the era of noise, the era of, um, of uh, sound, 
curtains uh, is, of course, um, a reason for us to reflect on silence, to reflect on pose, to reflect on nuances, and it becomes increasingly important. Um, in today's world, although 10% may be listening to the BBC or to the cl classic uh, program, uh, I think it is difficult for any little string quartet or for any gentleman in black tails standing next to a grand piano uh, to compete uh, at least uh, visually <coughs> with a kind of packaging that modern uh, pop music has. You can't compete with 50,000 people, people and, the f and the firework of sounds and lights and colors uh, exposed at the, uh, the, uh, uh, the new the pop concerts of the last 20 years or 30 years. Uh, opera, as was indicated here, is also fighting with that, also fighting for a uh, kind of a narrative argument. And this is the challenge uh, for opera to show that we are not only a museum, but we have something relevant to present. And there are lots of efforts making Mozart relevant, making Verdi relevant, making um, Wagner relevant, and so on. Uh, through putting the protagonist in jeans, putting them in bars, putting them in, the, in a subway station, on an airport, or, or equipping them with, uh, with a mobile telephone, a laptop, uh, or whatever, or referring to, to contemporary terrorism. Uh, all these sorts of tricks are there, and I think can, are sometimes very intelligently made and also contribute to this kind of narrative argument. Now, for many young people, the threshold is, however, uh, rather high to, to get into the classical music, because you are not automatically confronted with the world of classical music. Um, it is be, because the world, the, the, the sound world that you are confronted with is that what we hear in the supermarkets and in the, uh, in the shopping malls and so on and, and in the streets. Uh, and this, in my view, coming from a, let's say, northern European culture where there, where there is a tradition in this field, uh, is to, uh, that society has a, has a responsibility. Schools have responsibility. All educational instances have responsibilities. And the public service, of course, radio and television, have responsibilities in uh, teaching. It's like good literature. You don't enter in, uh, into it automatically. You have somehow to get acquainted with it and get the taste of it. That is the point. I think you have to get the taste. Uh, I, I don't want to boost too much about Sweden, but we have one, this model uh, called the Kommunala uh, Musikskola, the municipality schools, which are offering all children attending schools from 5 to 13 uh, professional teaching on instruments, or for that sake, uh, singing or quiet singing, quiet, uh, choir singing. Uh, and the instruments are free, free of charge. I'm not sure in what financial position these schools are exactly today, but uh, they have, are running into some problems. But uh, this has been a very important instrument for people uh, entering the world of, mu uh, of music. Through making music, they become good listeners. <laughs> Uh, we usually explain the phenomena, ABBA, Ace of Base, uh, Europe, uh, Robin, uh, uh, Roxette, and so on, with these very ambitious uh, uh, municipality music schools. So I mean that learning to listen uh, is, comes through learning to play or learning to express yourself through music or, or through some co sort of organized noise. Uh, education is uh, essential, and <coughs> the innocent ear, which was referred to, is not enough. 
Another example, which is very much talked about these days, is of course El Sistema, uh, this Venezuela um, um, model from uh, José Antonio Abreu, uh, which is uh, teaching uh, hundreds of thousands uh, or perhaps even millions of young children to uh, participate in orchestras and choirs. This, of course, has also an enormous social uh, impact. One word about acoustics. Uh, listening to acoustic instruments. Uh, electricity was referred to. Uh, but acoustic instruments, not amplified, to a voice, not amplified, uh, through technique, uh, through, through, elec through electricity. A voice uh, which has been trained uh, for, uh, to a good technique, a good focus, <coughs> and which does not need any microphones. This is something, something very essential and, and something which we really should care to preserve. There are, I, for instance, I'm rather skeptical to such typical studio, uh, studio products in uh, classical music, like uh, I'm afraid to, I, I have to to, uh, to slaughter some holy cows here, uh, uh, Anne-Sophie von Otter and Cecilia Bartoli. Uh, if you hear them live on a, on a huge stage, you will be disappointed, but their studio products are wonderful. Now, I do love to, uh, to listen to, um, to the Beatles, to Springsteen, to Michael Jackson, to B.B. King, to Madonna and others. Uh, and it may be, I think we have to be, uh, be very modest from the classical side and say that perhaps these are today uh, the great masters. Who knows what uh, Verdi or der Wagner would have become if they have lived now. Um, these are all elitist views. Well, of course, they are. They are probably elitist, but I think we need uh, we need a top and we need the iceberg. We need uh, the elites in music just like we need it in rit literature or in el any other uh, uh, arts and walks of life. Uh, I personally, I will, I will finish with that, Madam Chair. Uh, I personally left diplomacy for a few years in order to sing opera just to satisfy my needs for discipline and precision. Uh, because there's a lot of discipline and precision in good music. The freedom and the improvisation I could jo enjoy as a bureaucrat or a, or a diplomat. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So a clarion call to all the elitists in the audience there. Um, and so we'll wrap up with uh, Tom Hutchinson. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, as probably the person who comes from the most classical background on the panel, maybe except for Ivan, um, I'm actually going to steer away from talking about classical music and even music in general and focus more on listening. Because for the past two and a half years, I've had an amazing time and a wonderful opportunity to run the Hear Hear project, which has been working with everyone who is connected with the ear, listening and hearing um, around the country, exploring what listening actually is. And and certainly when we were devising the project of the Royal Philharmonic Society, we certainly felt that the skill of listening, or just indeed the sense of listening, was something which maybe isn't thought about enough. Um, so through the project, we've looked at lo lots of different areas about listening. We've looked at how vision influences listening, the role of memory, how our cultural and social backgrounds and our, and our worlds influence how we listen, and how we use language even to describe our own listening experiences how we use words. And as I said, we've worked, at, worked with many different partners from science, research, literature, and dance. But now I just wanted to maybe talk about a couple of the, a few of the, um, maybe the main points which have come from doing this work and which seem to be um, carrying through the argument. And one is just the, the fact that listening seems to be an omnipresent sense. It is an omnipresent sense. It's usually the first sense we engage with when we wake up. It's the last sense we um, hear or listen to or engage when we go to sleep. We can't close our eyes like we can close, uh, close our ears like we can close our eyes. Um, but the flip side is it sort of makes listening a Cinderella sense. It's always there, so do we just forget about it? And are we living in a desensitized world? To be human is to sense. 
But to sense requires a point in which to sense from. It requires a point of perspective. It requires a distance from the source. But is this increasingly becoming difficult to find in an ever-saturated world, not just of sound, but of information? Filtering. Of course, it is true we need to filter out our information, otherwise we would go mad. And much of this is done on a subconscious level anyway. However, we still need the ability to consciously focus in on something. This applies to all the senses. But if we are moving towards a world where we have to filter more, does that skew the balance too much and indeed reduce our ability to listen perceptively? Listening is a skill. It does need practice. Of course, one of the ways in which we filter sounds nowadays is by blocking it out with other sound, e.g. iPods. How commonplace is it to see people of all ages on the tube listening to their favorite tracks? Yet this phenomenon has numerous points of interest. Firstly, the recommended time to listen to iPods is 60 minutes a day at only 60% of the volume. Hmm, is that really the most common exposure time we all do? I have an iPod, I don't listen to it, but you know, 60% at 60 minutes. Or how about when you go to a nightclub? Average decibel levels of about 100 to 120. Common in these types of places. But when we look at the, uh, the listening levels and for a human ear, that reduces the exposure time to four minutes. How many times do you go down to central London and spend four minutes in your favorite club? Birds and some amphibians can rejuvenate their hair, the hair cells in the ear, but humans can't. Are we going to end up with a, with a generation that has severe hearing loss because of this kind of listening? This throws up an, un, an interesting point also. In the Industrial Revolution, people were deafened because of their work environments were so noisy. No, no noise work, uh, work regulations for them. But now the opposite is true. The regulations are there for work, albeit to protect the companies, but not for leisure. Indeed, we're now in an environment where we can choose to put our ears, our hearing, our listening faculty at great risk. A curious benefit of, few, of free choice. Central, of course, to this, is the debate, uh, to this debate is also the subject of devaluing music. Because if it is there all the time, how do we value it? I would argue it decreases because it's so omnipresent. The sense of specialness, the sense of innovation is lost because we're used to it. It becomes a mediocre habit. Yet music does have the ability to transcend the listener. And indeed, because the way the music is constructed, there are always deeper levels to explore, be it compositionally, socially, comparatively. But living in a world which has a background accompaniment does reduce this. Indeed, does it become a crutch? The restaurant that eternally plays music. What's wrong with silence? Are we afraid of it? Out of all the arts, is it not true that music is the most devalued? And finally, one other point to throw into the bag. I've got lots more, but I know my time is short. And that's to do with education. Unfortunately, we now have a curriculum that ultimately places music at the bottom of the pile. PGCE teacher training, if you are non-specialist music, um, gives only about eight hours of the course, and that's for a full year on music, with the result that the majority of schools and music lessons are taken by non-specialist teachers, particularly at primary level. I'm doing a, working on a primary level um, project in Cardiff at the moment, and we'll talk about, a bit about that later. Combined with a thrust and emphasis towards key subjects, often results in music not getting a look in. Not enough time, not enough money, not enough resource. Yet music should be at the center of our education. Music can foster so many of the skills that our youngsters need. Listening, team building, thinking abstractly, increasing the ability to discern, compare, value, to promote imagination, to promote creativity. Indeed, what I would argue for is an education that brings all the senses, brings what it is to be human, back to the center. Then we would start to see real creativity and change in the education system and in our society. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, I'll just ask a couple of questions up here on the panel because I'm aware that time is short. So, um, firstly, just coming to this idea of this link, I think, between music education and music listening and music criticism that Tom has, has talked about, I was just interested to throw that out to Ivan. 
Um, I think because a lot of people will talk today about how there's lots of music around in society, it's very difficult to make sense of it. Um, and it's very difficult to know how to listen to it and how to listen to different sorts of, of music. Um, and I wondered what your experience was or what your thoughts were as a music critic um, when it comes to perhaps being able to tell people which sorts of music to listen to, which sorts of music to not listen to, um, and to make sense of what people often refer to as this sort of mess of music that there seems to be. Yes, well, it's really hard. Um, I guess what I try and cling on to is the idea that underlying all these varieties, maybe not all of them, but many of them, are certain kinds of, of musical universals, let's say. I know that's a really dodgy idea to raise, and I, I mean, I'm, wait I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be shot down in flames for even suggesting such a wicked thing. Um, because, of course, when you suggest musical universals, when you're put into a corner, of course, what it really means is Western universals. Um, because it's the West that's given us the terminology for talking about music. It's the West that invented the term chord, you know, harmony, uh, form, counterpoint. You know, these, we didn't borrow these terms from anywhere else. They're our terms. And for many people, that makes it illegitimate to even think about using them anywhere else. You know, that to apply them outside those fields is, is somehow perverting of the nature of other kinds of music. Um, I, I don't hold with this. I think if you, I think a, a, a kind of training and education in listening, which incidentally I think has to go hand in hand with the training in doing. I, I think, if I can just make a little parenthesis here, uh, it's very easy to slip into the way of thinking that our forebears back in the 19th century had magnificent powers of concentration, you know, and, and, the, and that they could sit in reverential silence. 45 minutes through a late Beethoven quartet in a way that, in a way that we just can't manage somehow. Um, I mean, I, I, just, I, I don't altogether buy this. I, I think perhaps the reason that they were perhaps more connected to their musical culture is that they did things. They played stuff. You know, they had music in their piano stools. A, a Philip's story about the two school teachers playing Strauss's Symphonia Domestica, it's such a marvelous story that. It's so hard, you know. They must have been that what phenomenal pianist they must have been. That's incredible. The fact that they were able to do that, you know, however stumblingly, is surely connected with the fact that maybe they were better listeners. I, I don't. I can't believe that they were somehow, on the level of pure mental powers, better endowed than we than we are. So I don't think we should beat ourselves up about that. It's. Um, but to, to return to the other, the, the first question, um, I think that. We in the West, if we, if we make use of the culture that we have in an unembarrassed, unapologetic way, we'll find that we are thereby empowered to listen to lots of other kinds of music. I think the mistake is to, rather like comparative religion for, for children, I think it leads to colossal confusion. I, I think if we equip children, young children, with, with the ability to both make and hear Western art music, they will find that they are better equipped to hear many other kinds of music. Okay. So I, I would nail that, I'd nail my right. colours to them. Philip's indicating it. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to make the observation that um, many of the um, entry level uh, works of classical music, the sort of thing that is customarily thought of being suitable for novices and uh, the young, um, they're actually pretty off putting, I think. They, um, they, they smell a bit. Um, and in that category, I would, put, I would put the last night of the proms. It seems to me extraordinary that the public face of art music in this country is the last night of the proms. It really is. And then there are all those dreary works that are always foisted on children, aren't there? You'll enjoy this. There's Ina Klein and Nat's music. There's the Carnival, the Admirals. And there's the Young Person's Guide to the Sodding Orchestra. And... I just think that, from experience with you know people that I know, I, I just know that if they happen to get a bit beyond that, and the first piece of classical art music they come across is the Rite of Spring, or the 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 late Beethoven C sharp minor quartet, which which Shaw said was beautiful and simple, it wasn't difficult and abstruse. If they come across one of those very curious, individual, characterful pieces, instead of Benjamin Britten mucking about with Purcell, 
then they're quite likely to develop an enthusiasm. It's that kind of level of patronising, oh, you'll enjoy this, it's Ina Klein and Nacht music, and here's a story about Mozart and his periwig. You know, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. OK, thank you. Um, so on that provocation, oh, we'll just get Rachel in first, and then I think we've got two microphones, is that right, at the back? No, just, just the one, OK, thank you. But I, I still want to ask the question, um, why... Um, why aren't modern classical composers giving us what we want? Yes, they are. I, well, I don't, think, I don't think they are. I think if you're trying to convert young children to, to classical music, I mean, what are you going to play? Do you, is Judith Weir going to turn on an 11-year-old? Well, maybe, maybe. Um, yeah. Why not? It's, 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 I, I used, when, when I was... I've, I've got classical music training, but, you know, I, st I still have difficulty with, with these composers. When I was at university, I used to go, I used to go and take out all sorts of music on the grounds that I'd never heard it before and just play it in the background and see what grabbed me. That way I fell in love with Prokofiev's violin concertos, I fell in love with Ravel's piano concerto. Today before I left, just to test myself, I played some Schoenberg. I played his uh, Zechs Klavier Stücke. Um, I, found it, I found it unbearable. It gave me a headache. Well, it, that's, you know, 98 and I, may, may, maybe, maybe that is deeply subjective, but the, the, the fact is that there, you, we're, we're talking a lot here about concentration and, and music's ability to grab us. I think there's quite a lot of music post-1950, and I'm expecting to be ripped apart for this. Please feel free to say so. It, 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 it stirs us up, and it, 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 it creates difficult emotions. It, um, it's, it's, it's not something that lends itself to listening. It's something that lends itself to intellectual grappling. Um, and... And for that reason, I think it's very difficult for it to become a music of the people. OK, right, thank you. I think there's a lot of people wanting well, to uh, no, get in with some intellectual grappling. Um, so can I just see the microphones, please? OK, will you just give it to this, um, the person at the back with the pen? Yep, thank you. Hi. Why is everyone just talking about classical music? I think that there are composers today giving the music that people want. Um, that is challenging intellectually and not only emotionally stimulating, but they're just doing it in other areas. They're doing it in electronic music, um, partly because that enables an expansion of the discipline precision that Eric was talking about, but also because it speaks more to people's experience of a contemporary lifestyle, which classical music doesn't. So I think the debate really needs to sort of open out and stop thinking that classical music needs to do all these things and actually think about music in a much wider sense and how there are lots of different types of music which are very stimulating and challenging and aren't just about emotional or somatic um, sort of good vibes or things like that. Okay, so classical music should get over itself. So. Okay, um, if you just pass the microphone forward, if we just work down there. Um, but first we'll have this guy at the, the front. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, we've talked about listening to classical music, but what if you listen to like some ACDC instead of Beethoven? Or all that. Like we've talked, less, we've talked about sawing a piano or something. But and to what extent does it depend on the popularity of the music? Like, does it really matter if loads of people listen to the music or not? Can't the music still live for itself? Okay, thank you. Know, you. Um, you know, ACDC. I've heard tonic subdominant dominant tonic, and I don't think it really matters. You know, it's all it's been done. I, I'm, it just it doesn't interest me. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I've got this gentleman here, thanks. This one? Yep. Thank you. Um, first of all, I really enjoyed the conversation, and I have to applaud several things, particularly that Rachel said. You're absolutely right to be utterly sceptical about the neuroscience of music. As a neuroscientist, most of it is absolute bullshit. And, there's very un and I particularly focus on Oliver Sacks' comments in this respect. It is, it is totally... Uh, has very little foundation, so you can completely relax about the neuroscience. Uh, secondly, I, I think your question about contemporary music is a very important one. And one of the things that happened was that music was produced quite separately from any demand for it or enjoyment of it outside a narrow circle of people because, by the way, it was funded. And it can be funded through academe and so on and so forth. If you think of the pressures on some of the great classical composers, Bach, to produce something you know, once a week, which is absolutely fantastic, uh, you, you realise how different the context in which much contemporary music was, present, uh, was created. And one of the heartbreaking things about people like Bach is, yes, they delivered on contract, 
but they delivered massively over contract as well. And it was, that was their genius, you know, they had to produce you know, the weekly cantata, but that cantata was far better than it needed to be. So they were still pleasing their patrons or their, the people who hired them. One final comment on, on, on uh, what Tom was saying. It does seem to me we need a rebellion against involuntary music. I, we need a rebellion against involuntary music. That is to say, the music that is poured like paraquat on every conversation you have in a restaurant to make it more difficult to communicate with the person you're with. Yeah. Um, I hesitate to mention something as perhaps as vulgar as a television programme, which might, even on BBC Two, which might even be classified as a reality programme, but I don't know if people here saw Gareth Malone's thing of the South Oxy Community Choir. That was a programme which showed people who had no musical training, if given the opportunity and the encouragement, learnt quite complex pieces and came to appreciate them and shows the importance of music education because I think many experiences demonstrate that if people are given the chance to do and to come into contact, then they will be interested. Well, I'd enjoy that sort of okay, thing. Okay, thank you, sir. So uh, I think we've got a guy at the front here. Um, yeah, just a few things. I mean, I, um, I find the idea of the popularity of classical music um, being important, bizarre, since good quality music simply requires a good quality audience, not an enormous audience. Um, also, what was I thinking about? Um, yeah, I, I think there's also a very strange idea that music somewhat, it completely changed after the 1950s. It's interesting when people get into classical debates, how they write out minimalism. Still easily, as a secondary school music teacher, the easiest subject, one of the easiest subjects, including pop music, to teach in the classroom. I'm going to see Steve Reich tonight, and it is sold out. Um, but one other thing I was going to ask is, um, uh, just for, uh, for Tom really, um, is um, in, in schools, uh, the writing of music into the curriculum uh, kind of leaves it as a sort of IKEA uh, flat pack sort of system, which you assemble all the right technical bits, and if the students have got it right. Now, I've taught musical futures a lot, which is part of the Paul Hamlin Foundation, and although I think it leaves students in a very tricky situation for GCSE, there's no doubt that if given the right equipment, they really like it. This is a sort of rock music education system. How can we start building an effective aesthetic education into the national curriculum? Okay, no mean feat. Thank you there. Uh, there's a gentleman at the front. Yes, thank you. I have to confess, I'm intrigued by what I understood the question to be about. That is, why does listening to music matter? And so I'd like to hear more from the panel about that. When I step back, I find it extraordinary to think that human beings will go into a hall and sit down for hours and do nothing but listen to a lot of sounds. I find it extraordinary that people will walk up and down the street with iPods or sit in an underground and listen to sounds. Why does it matter to them? I, and what is listening all about? I listen, I think, to music when I'm working, when I'm eating. That's very different from putting a CD on and doing nothing else or going to a concert. Am I listening or am I just hearing music? And do I lose something that matters because I'm not listening? Okay, thank you. So different, different sorts of listening. We've got two more questions from the audience. We'll have a very brief back at the panel and then we'll come out again. So this gentleman here, and I think one, one guy at the back who was just right at the back there has been waiting for a while. Thank you. Thanks. I was a bit confused about how much you're saying I've got to work to get a cultivated or cultured ear and how much I should enjoy it. And would you be prepared to, you know, just because it's music, would you be prepared to look me in the eyes and say, look, you bastard, you've got to do some listening properly um, to get this? Or is that, am I completely missing the point about what it means to get a culture there? Because I sense that there's, there's a sort of education, a deeper educational point going on than just um, neuroscience or skills of listening. There must be more to it than that, isn't there? About it being a human, um, you know, for, for the force of the music that someone's got to believe in. Okay, thank you. And one last point, I think, from the back before we come back to the panel. As somebody who's come to classical music later in life, um, a, a convert, I find this whole discussion really bizarre. Because one of the reasons I came to classical music is because it is better. 
It is more interesting, it is more complex, it is more, it, it's richer and it's more rewarding than any other form of music. And I, I used to play music uh, prof semi-professionally years ago, and, and classical music is superior, I think. And I, it's just the, the point about modesty, I'm thinking it's almost the opposite that you need. You need to have faith that classical music is actually better than other musics. And, you know, rather than saying that, that, you know, trying to interest children in rock music and trying to go through and, and show the chord structure of rock music, how to turn people off of any kind of music, you need to say this is adult music. And if you say this is adult music, that will get the children very interesting in the same way that anything that is adult gets children very interested. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll just have very, very brief responses from the, from the panel before we go back out in. So, Carl Eric, I think. Okay. I think you are right. Uh, I think it is better uh, because it's simply you have to work harder to, to, to uh, achieve a certain level of excellence. But there is this point which Rachel made also and which I hinted at, uh, namely that perhaps uh, through the uh, modern media, uh, the channelization of, tenel, of talent and excellence have turned somehow. So perhaps today's Mozart or Verdi and so on are to be found outside the so-called arts music or classical music because there is, the competition is very hard. This is a little bit blurred, I agree, but I think there are some uh, really excellent works among, among a, a modern popular music and perhaps uh, Wagner would have been Michael Jackson if he had lived uh, uh, today. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, second, the second thing about Western music, I, I think we have to define that a little bit. What is Western? I think it's European. The, uh, the, in Europe, we organized scores and beats and, uh, and bars and so on. Uh, the, then we in, to Western music also is the, uh, the music which started with jazz music and developed into, in, into popular music, and that is, of course, the, some of the most genius uh, jazz players never uh, could not read music, could not read from a score, but they were absolute uh, uh, genius. So that is also part of Western Europe, but uh, well, Western music. But but uh, what we mean with Europe, we mean from Novosibirsk to uh, to uh, Lisbon, I think. Okay, thank you. Philip, is there things in there you want to come back to? Well, I'm not very patient with that argument that if Wagner was alive today, he'd be Michael Jackson, frankly. <laughs> I think if you remove a human being from every cultural uh, thing that constructed their mind, their thought, and plunked them down in a different place, then they wouldn't be the same human being at all. Or as the Spanish so accurately say, if my auntie had a dick, she'd be my uncle. Um, <laughs> I really, I really don't believe that, and I think, um, I think that there is a fundamental difference between uh, a Wagner and a Michael Jackson, which is Wagner's, um, the whole history of art music is of people looking backwards and knowing what has been done before, of being interested, of, being, of understanding everything that's led up to that point. The composers in the history of, of art music who, who didn't, who didn't do that, and the one who stands out is Janáček, who for geographical reasons didn't know a large part of art music, are oddities. However, I think that uh, what we've moved into now, this thing that uh, is constantly being presented to us as a, um, as a continuity, you know, if Wagner was alive today, he'd be Michael Jackson. Um, there is a difference because, you know, a Michael Jackson, a Whitney Houston, uh, whatever. Firstly, they're not, uh, they're not solitary creative figures in the way that Wagner, however the large the scale of his operation were. Secondly, their terms of reference don't go back to Bach. They really don't. They, it goes back to probably about 40 years, I would say. I think that's a fundamental difference and I think that uh, there is a severance that's happened between the art now and uh, the great history of the art and I think that's a tragedy. Okay, thank you. So, Rachel, I think, and then Tom, perhaps you want to g g talk as well about this uh, question of, of education. How far would you go? Um, I just want to address the gentleman at the, um, the back talking about um, who, who became a, a late classical music listener. Um, I mean, I, I agree with you, I, I, which is slightly why I surprised myself with the way my argument turned out. I, I do have a 
strong classical music training. Um, it allows me to lament the relentless fall forward the banal harmless of the Kaiser Chiefs. Um, it's, it's why I feel that Radiohead is a truly excellent band because I perceive they have a true musical complexity. Um, but I mean, there, there, there is a, this, this very difficult question, and it's, it's, it's partly to do with what Philip, Philip raised. You know, the, the, the two questions why don't muggers like music, and why doesn't BBC Two play it? have the same answer, it is, it, which is it is not seen as being of the people. Now maybe Tom does have the ultimate answer here, this is, you know, it's all down to education. Um, El Sustainable was mentioned by uh, somebody, I know right now there are projects going on in South London and in Scotland to take classical music out onto the estates uh, to train children to play it. Um, so, but both so that they will be robbed of the prejudices surrounding classical music and, and you know, that it will be able to reap some of its benefits. So maybe we're, we're, you know, we are on the cusp of the golden age. You know, people are starting to be educated in the right way. And maybe we can look forward to the day when Stockwell will have to stop playing Beethoven uh, because of worries of overcrowding. Okay, thanks. A uh, short point from Tom and then we'll come straight back out. It won't be very short. I want to talk about lots of things. Oh, very quick. Okay. Um, importance of listening, this guy over here. Um, oh, so many things. I mean, the communal experience is one of the things I think is really central to going to a concert and, or going to anywhere and just listening, the communal experience. Um, a sense of respite, actually getting out of society and going somewhere where it is actually deemed quiet or not quiet, being with your own social group. It could be a rock concert, anything. That sense of going away from the normal and doing something different. It also links into actually that live ticket sales and really holding up. Uh, at the moment, I mean, not, not, not being affected by the credit crunch. Also, you know, music is a mechanical, um, uh, listening is a mechanical action. It's in, in, the, in the ear, you know, you've got, it's a completely medical thing, so it actually moves us. You know, I was talking to someone from the Philharmonia the other day and said, well, you know, why do most people go to the tape, the tape modern and, and look at lots of these contemporary apps, but they just go to the contemporary classical music concerts? Well, I think it's partly because, first, the setup, you can move about and walk out of the archive if you want to, or you're at, you're at liberty, you're not just sat in a seat. But also because I think the actual skill of listening, or, or the, the sense of listening, the listening process, is mechanical. It gets inside us and moves us far greater, I would argue, than just something, just seeing art on a wall. Right? Not nothing against um, visual art in the slightest. Um, the next, I, I want to stay, stay clear from this good music, better music. You know, I listen to everything. There's no, there's no, I agree with what Philip's saying about the history and, the, and, and, and how we've maybe lost touch with the evolution of music. I think that's very important, particularly for education, which I'll come on to. Um, but this idea of, of some music being better, I just think we just need to be listening to good music. And that doesn't matter what any genre is. Any genre has good music in it. And I listen to anything from Coco Rosie to, to, um, to Palestrina, you know. They just, you, you have to seek out the good music rather than just um, be prejudiced for the sake of it. Um, and also, just to say on that, the great, the great music doesn't need you. You know, be the score of B, Bach's B minor mass or um, Sergeant Pepper's, um, it, it doesn't need, um, it, can stay, it stands on its own. It's what you bring to it, which I think is another important point. Um, okay, let's go back to education, national curriculum. Um, I, I don't hate it, but I think it could be a lot better. Um, what could happen? I agree with Ivan about doing. Singing is so important, the Sing Up project in government, getting children involved. Of course, a lot of it comes down to money. I've said before, there's no resource. Um, so, you know, schools just don't have the facility to do it. It requires the orchestras or local arts organisations to come in and help them do it, which is an awful um, situation at the moment. Um, but also dancing. I want, to that, I want to just put a flag up for dance, because dance was so central to the curriculum 40, 50 years ago. And where is it now in education? Completely gone. This idea of movement and moving to music creates a physical connection there. The last two evenings, I'm going to carry on, the last two evenings I was at Mark Morris. If you need, at Sadler's Wells, go tonight if you can. If you want a, a fantastic experience of listening to Ives, Beethoven and whatever, go and listen to Mark Morris. Okay, thanks, Stu. I'm just going to have to <laughs> stop, you, stop you there. Um, can I see hands, please, for people who are still waiting? Um, okay, if we can start this, this side mic at the back and just work forward, please. Um, and if we can start this one at the front and work backwards. Thank you. Um, so go this side, this side. Yes. Okay, just briefly. I mean, I've spent uh, my life as a, a performing musician, but also as an educationist. And uh, it, it surprises me, actually, uh, from the kids I've worked with. And I've worked in Japan, I've worked in uh, the townships in South Africa, I've worked in inner cities here for a time I was head of education at the Opera House. Uh, it surprises me how that if you introduce kids in the right sort of way to elements of music, and I don't care whether it's Kaiser Chiefs, 
or whether it's Rite of Spring. We did a, a project in South Japan a little while ago about the dwarf, the Zemlinsky opera, which is about really about Oscar Wilde and all his challenges in life. And that was with nine-year-old Japanese children. So it depends on how you introduce kids to these things. It doesn't really matter what the music is. I think there's a lot of account spoken about the right educational way forwards. Actually, it is about listening, and it's about finding ways to introduce kids and anybody, even adults, into these arenas in a much more beneficial way. OK, thank you. And <laughs> start with this guy at the front, please, and then we'll... Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> yes, thanks very much. Uh, just three points, I'll try and make them as briefly as I can. I was amazed um, when Carl Eric got us to shut up for 20 seconds how my um, powers of listening were dramatically enhanced, and I was hearing all kinds of things going on. So that was a very interesting exercise. I think that um, Rachel's uh, anecdotes about uh, singing to her son are very interesting, and I think it's Daniel Barenboim who said that um, actually music is musical expression, musical experience, musical expression is in fact an essential element of full human expression. So maybe it should be categorized with nappies and, uh, and feeding uh, and should be part of it. Certainly in South Africa where I come from, um, it is unthinkable for a three-year-old child not to be musical in a natural sense. Every three-year-old child in South Africa that I know of um, is both singing and moving by the age of three. But that's internal instinctual. Uh, there are now projects to use the teaching of reading music and playing and listening to music on a large scale um, in, in South Africa, which I think is a, a brilliant project, and we're trying to get more, more support um, for that. I, I, I did listen to the... Uh, to the uh, I, I did watch the, uh, the Gareth Miller program, and I thought it was uh, absolutely outstanding on South Oxy. I was also fortunate enough to have him as a choir um, teacher um, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and I think that the Maestro program uh, was, also, was also brilliant. But uh, just to finish up on um, listening to music, the gentleman in the front there, um, listening to music for me, um, I think if you can't afford a shrink, um, listening to a really good, you know, Hill's Messiah or Beethoven's Fifth Symphony or whatever, it changes your, changes your being. You, you, you're different at the end of it. Um, and as Simon Rattle said, I think, uh, with it wasn't listening to music, but was conducting it, um, it's higher than a drug's high, and it's, it's higher than an orgasm. So there we go. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Less therapy, more music. Um, we have this guy um, over here, please. And then... Thanks. Um, well, actually, it does matter what you listen to. I think most people in this room have a very firm idea what type of music is better than what other type of music, but we all, you included, seem remarkably diffident about saying so. You all seem at great pains to say what other music you, you, like, you like apart from the value you actually, the, the music you actually value. So I want to ask why that is. In particular, why are we so much um, more nervous about defending our standards in music than we are in, say, literature? I mean, as someone who, as someone who was acculturated in a household where I thought that literature meant Mills and Boone and music meant Radio 2. Um, you know, I grew out of it. I grew out of those adolescent <coughs> standards. And if we now know someone who reads only Mills and Boone, we generally have no qualms about trying to put them right. We try to steer them in the direction of listening to, listening to something a bit more adult. Whereas someone who listens to the equivalent of Mills and Boone in music, the same few chords and the same few adolescent lyrics, we, see, we seem somehow very scared about trying to make any value judgments about this. So I'd like to know why you think that is, um, and maybe, oh, there we are, that's it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I see hands on this side, please? Um, I'm a politician with the Pirate Party, um, and one of the arguments I've been making is that if the record companies fall and we have new business models that rely on word of mouth, um, that'll be a good thing for public culture because the public will be able to recommend better and better artists to each other. Um, do the panel agree and do they think that not being fed a constant diet of well-marketed dizzy rascals um, will, will lead the public to naturally, through free choice, get a more cultured ear um, and listen to more interesting works or do they think that the public likes dizzy rascal because the public likes dizzy rascal? Okay, good, thank you. Um, and hands on this side, we just go. Thanks. Oh. 
Uh, I respect classical music and I sympathise with the whole, um, you know, we must expose the children to this uh, sort of attitude, but yeah, that sounds a bit wrong. Um, the, like, I'd like to impose a bit of humility though, because classical music gets a tremendous amount of respect and attention and subsidies and teaching time and you know there are other art forms that are stagnating because uh, because they don't they lack this you know graphic novels and video games uh, in particular and to some degree film um, that kind of thing like you, you need to prioritize and classical music already gets a very large amount of it disproportionate I think Okay, thank you. That was Hamish Todd, who is doing a debate on video games this weekend. Um, can we also, can I just see more hands for for final final points from the floor, please? Um, this guy here, if we can just go to him next. Hi. Um, and can we just put hands up again, please? Thanks. And so, if you can come round to the back, um, thank you. I had a few thoughts on that. I'm a composer for film, so I was thinking that maybe we should take into account that when uh, couple of uh, dozen of millions of people are watching a film, they are very often exposed to a very fine classical track because a lot of it is done with orchestral means, right? Uh, second thing, I was wondering in the 19th century, how, what was the percentage actually of the people listening to classical music? I mean, apart from the very wealthy, I was wondering if, you know, if I mean, mainly, uh, I would think it would be the uh, traditional music played in the mountains and in the countryside that people, you know, would have fun with. I don't know. I mean, I would think. So, in a sense, I think there are a lot more people listening to classical music now than they were. I mean, percentage-wise, I think, I should think. Mainly because of the film and uh, because of the media being present much more now than they were then, because they were non-existent. And just one last thought on uh, the kids. I notice often when I take the tube in Paris, um, kids never stay quiet. They either play to iP they either listen to the iPod, and if that's not enough, they text. So I think we're mainly in the uh, civilization where people are afraid to just sit quietly. And I think that's what maybe one of the reasons why they just keep on listening to something. Not necessarily they like it, but it just fills the space. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Uh, do we have another point from the back? Yes. Um, yes. Uh, hello. Sorry. Um, I'd like to hear a stronger defense of, I suppose, musical content from the panel. I don't think it's quite right to say that there's good and bad in every genre, or if it is, then it's a bit banal, uh, because dance music essentially has no content other than for you to dance, whereas uh, classical music has content that is external to you that you have to engage with um, and you know apply yourself to. So listening to Bach... Uh, you know, it requires effort. Um. Okay, so the effort's involved, yeah. Uh, yes, so, sorry, I suppose my point is that some music actually has content and I think that needs to be defended, whereas other music tends to be more kind of adolescent and has more diminished content. Yes, okay, right, thank you. And a point here from the right. Any, any more points that people want to make? Um, one at the frontier and then, okay, right, thank you. I suppose I have a nagging worry that with music education for kids today, especially working class kids and in working class schools, um, teachers tend to, probably through government policy, tend to indulge um, kids far more than pushing them as the way they should. And, and the listening thing and team building thing had me worried and it, uh, kind of sound al sounded alarm bells to me. I'm forever <coughs> grateful for the teacher who in my school forced me to listen to classical music and it was, you know, he, he, you know, he probably uh, thinks that we didn't take him seriously but it was, it was quite hard work to do and I really appreciate that. Um, um, and now you see lots of courses about, you know, learn pop music and there's the famous Croydon School. Um, you know, I think we, as, you know, music, serious musicians, you need to kind of take responsibility and, and you know, uh, teach kids. And I think the Venezuelan example is really, really inspiring. I think that's working precisely because kids are actually being pushed. And that's what you, that's what you need to do, and that's what we need to do. Okay, thank you. Um, and, yep. Uh, yeah, just say, I actually think you guys are on the wrong side of the argument. You're basically arguing for a form of cultural conservatism. You're basically saying we should try and avoid these new innovations, avoid these new sort of music because rubbish. it's not good enough. It's rubbish. 
Well, you are. The, You've been, the, panel, you, the panel have time to okay. come back. Yeah. Um, just feel like, basically what you're saying is that any, if anybody actually likes popular music, they're uneducated and aesthet aesthetically deficient. Yeah, it is more... <laughs> Oh, that, I'll be interesting to hear what you have to say, say okay, to that. If you can just finish, finish your point, thank you. And yeah. it's qu actually quite patronising what you've been saying about popular music so far. That somebody has said here that it's got no contents, that it's not connected to musical history. First of all, that's not true. It is connected to its musical history. Perhaps musical history that's not quite as connected to classical music, but it's also because classical music has become a very elitist form of music, which has become more or less irrelevant to musical developments right now. I'd be very interested in what you have to say if you disagree with me. Okay, thank you very much. I think we've got one more point at the front here. Did you want to speak, sir? No? Oh, you did, yeah. Um, and then you can take yourself. Um, for me, something that hasn't been talked about so much is how music is linked to identity and values. And a lot of the way young people consume music is being sold as part of a package of a lifestyle that people aspire to. So um, an answer for me to this question is that classical music hasn't got a set of values that young people are looking up to and that the institutions haven't changed to appeal to how young people have changed. I yeah. uh, just want some thoughts on that. Okay, thank you. And final point. Um, I suppose my kind of point is sort of considering that music's kind of something that's common in almost every society in the world. I can't think of any society sort of either ancient or modern that hasn't had music. Do you think there's sort of something kind of quite primitive and in <coughs> inherent in kind of musicality in in terms of the way you walk, it's quite rhythmic. The way your heart beats, is quite rhythmic. And do you think that the kind of, the dressing up in the kind of, the semantics of kind of precision and sophistication are, some, are kind of less important about music than the kind of primitive nature and how music can sort of speak quite simply to someone. Uh, for instance, I played bass guitar and was taught by the bass player for, I think it's Michael Nyman, is that a composer? But he's played from everything from Michael Nyman to the theme of Blue Peter. Uh, he's kind of, got a long range but he's, he tried to introduce me to kind of bark and I ended up playing some bark but it just kind of didn't speak to me so what do you think are the kind of merits of kind of personal discovery and a kind of personal voyage and appreciation of music rather than the kind of wider social sense of what people should be appreciating and what makes music good and what people shouldn't be appreciating. Okay, thank you. Um, so, a broad amount of points there. Uh, we do have to be out of this room in about seven minutes. Um, there will be time to uh, discuss and talk afterwards. So I'm going to start over this side of the panel and whip through right over here. So you have about one and a half minutes, my master's isn't too, one and a half minutes to answer to what you want and uh, also sum up. Thank you. Hi, well, I'm, I'm actually going to finish with a question and it's, it's slightly picking up with what this gentleman uh, talks about, the musical's identity. Um, I said that I would find it difficult or indeed impossible to fall in love to liberty. And, you know, we've got a room full of people interested in music here. Does anyone disagree? Is there a post 1950s classical composer who someone has fallen in love to? Yes. Oh, oh, okay, thank you. Uh, we'll just we'll move. To, we're coming down. We'll go to Tom next. Thank you. Okay. Um, goodness. Right. I firstly would say that I don't think anyone on the panel is is raving about classical music and dissing down pop music. I just don't think that's the case at all. Certainly, I'm not. Um, I do think, however, that you can say that there are good and bad. Um, examples in all genres, I, I think that is absolutely the case. Um, and I don't think that you could say that the Beatle, Beatles doesn't have content and Bach always does and keep it as simple as that. Um, I think the social aspect is important, what you were saying. I think this idea of going, is going through different listening journeys is very important. And actually, psych, in psychology, they're looking a lot, in lot about this, how, how our tastes change and that actually our listening really does go through different periods in terms of our social network. So that's also very important. But the last thing I would just say is that no matter what you're listening to, all I would say is just have five seconds, ten seconds, a minute a day to actually consider the skill of listening. Are you listening? Are you listening when you wake up? Are you listening on the bus? It might broaden your horizons. So give some time to listen. Okay, thank you, Tom. Carl Eric. Uh, on the 19th century, I don't have the statistics, but uh, we all know the story about uh, Giuseppe Verdi's uh, pre premiere in 1842 of uh, Nabucco. Uh, where the famous choir, Va Pensiero Solari Dorata, uh, became a, like a pop song. Everybody in the streets, song, because it became a symbol of uh, uh, Italians, uh, Italy's Risorgimento. This was seven years before Garibaldi's first uh, effort. 
Uh, and so there are examples of 19th century very popular musicians. Second point, uh, re uh, neurology and uh, therapy has been, uh, been touched upon uh, marginally. But of course, this is extremely important when we speak about listening to and hearing music. We know that it has the effect on health. It has an effect even on life and, and perhaps even on death. Uh, because it can also be used as a torture instrument. But uh, that, that is an ex extremely important aspect. Finally, uh, why don't we speak uh, Tacheles, uh, as uh, the uh, Yiddish expression is uh, in Germany, why don't we speak openly? There is a political correctness, two aspects of political correctness, and one is among insider musicians, foundations, and, and conservatories. That is, we shall encourage difficult uh, contemporary music. Let's face it, that is, uh, that is uh, so done. The other part of political correctness is among politicians themselves, uh, national or local, and that is uh, uh, it shall serve diversity and it shall, if possible, solve uh, social problems, uh, particularly in suburbs and among poor. These are reasons why uh, people are not speaking so uh, frankly, perhaps, about these issues. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Philip. Well, I don't know if I really, I can really be bothered to say anything, actually, because whatever you oh, say... Oh, go on. No, whatever you say... Yeah, don't interrupt me. When, um, don't interrupt me when I'm refusing to speak. Um, because whatever you say on this subject, nobody hears what you say. I mean, I can sit here and say... Say, as I've been saying for, since I was 12 years old, I absolutely love post-1950s composers. I could tell you, tell you 30. I'm, I could, I've been in you know, huge opera houses full of people listening to the premiere of a Burt Whistle or a Ligeti opera, and still Rachel will say, you see, nobody likes it. It doesn't matter. There's no, the chap at the... Like no, hang, yeah, no, you... You're, no, you were making a more general point than that. You were saying that nobody could fall in love to it. That's yeah. just wrong. The bloke at the back says you're arguing for cultural conservatism. Now, what, you know, what is culturally conservative about, uh, about Stockhausen, about new, new art music? You know, someone at the bloke at the back probably thinks that to be radical, you should switch on the X Factor and watch some cover version. I mean, I just th think that it's got the wrong way around, so I'm not going to say anymore because nobody listens to what you say. <laughs> Four. <laughs> thank you, Philip. Um, and we'll, we'll end up with um, Ivan. Thank you. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's defeating me. God, where to start? Well, let's, let's end with El Sistema, shall we? Because everyone knows what that is. It's this wonderful Venezuelan youth orchestra that, that, that's charmed and electrified everybody. Why, what is so special about them? Why are they so electrifying? It's just a youth orchestra, you know? So, I mean, you could say, so what? Um, we have one of our own, very good. Uh, I think what's so remarkable about El Sistema is that they get past the cringe factor of classical music. So, somebody at the back there said, you know, why, why are you guys all tiptoeing around de declaring what you, what you like and what, you, what you're passionate about? These kids in El Sistema don't, don't seem to have any problem about rooting for classical music. They, they don't say to themselves, hey, this isn't my music, this isn't expressing me, this isn't about me. You know? um, and, and yet the music was created thousands of miles away from their country and two centuries before you know, their parents were born. It's not a problem for them. It's not a problem for them. So I think, I think this, this points to a big truth about classical music, which is that it, it's, it is... I, I concede to Rachel, um, not terribly good at enforcing group identity. Wonder, isn't that great? It doesn't help people to think, yeah, I belong to this tribe. Marvellous, that's its glory. It's not very good at, um, at you know, pr providing a smooth soundtrack to one's inner life as one sits on the tube. I find it is, it's hopeless. It's hopeless from that point of view. You miss your tube stop. It creates, it creates an, an electrifying uh, narrative which you have to pay attention to. That's why it doesn't work. It's, it's lousy for the iPod generation, I think. So that, that's its, maybe a way through this relativism to say that classical music can do special things. It can do, I won't say better things because it'll annoy somebody. Let's just say it can do particular things that no other form of music can do. And that's why we need to value it. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think we've raised more questions than we've managed to answer.